for organizing this um, lecture series and i hope uh, it lives up to the reputation it seems to have we have 300 participants now uh, i'll just start by making a prediction so i'm very theoretical type of physicist but my predictions are pretty good actually i, I should have been an experimentalist and my prediction is that in uh, by by friday this week uh, we'll be down to about uh, 60 uh, participants so i could be wrong but anyway says my prediction it will be recorded so you can check uh, anyway uh, there is a web page and uh, that i like you to note down uh, so yeah so the course is introduction to topology and differential geometry for physicists I'll spend a few minutes shouting about the fact that it is for physicists because people get confused about, uh, about that aspect. Uh, but before that, well, uh, welcome to my handwriting. This is it. It's not going to get better. It could get worse. Um, and uh, the web page is tdg-phys.blogspot.com. It's already up and it already has two entries. One is a welcome telling you, maybe I can even show it to you. Um, here it is. This is what it looks like. And uh, there are two entries. One is a list of reference material, uh, including the book which I'll be following by myself and, and Mukunda, um, which is the main reference, but I've given other references. I've also given a real mathematics uh, uh, reference, which you see here, this one by Singer and Thorpe. I don't know if my pencil can, no. Okay. Uh, this one here, uh, if you want more uh, rigorous uh, information. And then, of course, below, there's a welcome to the course with a list of the day-wise lecture plans. Uh, now, this is a little, this list was just made, uh, if I may say honestly. Actually, uh, each chapter, there are six chapters in the book, and each chapter took two um, and a half hours. Uh, so I'm certainly not going to rush through that much that I'll do each chapter in one lecture or something. But uh, given some crude plan, probably I'll be changing it as we go along. So that's the uh, thing. Now, uh, on the same page will be, uh, uh, first of all, you, uh, all students, all participants, uh, will be able to write comments on this page, on the posts. So you can comment and it's... it's um, the comment has to be subject to approval. So just to see that random uh, people don't uh, show up and type obscene things. But uh, your comments uh, on each post uh, will be approved and posted if they are sensible comments. So you can do that and I'll encourage you to do that. This comments means also includes questions. Um, it includes, uh, for example, if you uh, felt there's an error, maybe you didn't uh, spot it during the lecture, but you saw the recording or something, you can point it out there. Uh, then I should mention that uh, my colleague Sachin Jain, as well as uh, Ren Dr. Renjan John, who is uh, who has been uh, associated with Pfizer. Sorry. This is what I was afraid of anyway. Um, um, yeah, Sachin Jain and Renjan John have kindly agreed uh, to help in the capacity of uh, tutors. So they are going to be making exercises. There are already exercises in the book. They are going to make more exercises. And those will also be shared on the same uh, web page, this TDG fits. Uh, so you'll find the exercises there, uh, the corrections, any more references, any change of dates. For example, if for some reason a lecture has to be changed for some unforeseen circumstance, you'll find it there. Uh, so things like that. So please uh, bookmark this page and start to use it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, disclaimer done. Let's mark that. Uh, this is uh, fun. Yeah. Sorry. That's not disclaimer done. What am I saying? You see, I'm already losing it. Losing it. This is what's done. Now the disclaimer. The disclaimer is that I'm not a mathematician. I'm a theoretical physicist. And uh, let me give you a little history. I think we can waste a couple more minutes uh, before I start. In 1987, I was asked to give 14 lectures on this topic at uh, what used to be called the SCRC School on Theoretical High Energy Physics. And it was held in Shantiniketan where everything was great, particularly the food was excellent, as you can imagine. And um, I didn't know anything about this subject. I'd never studied topology. 
and I knew differential geometry the way most physicists pick it up a little bit just to use. Uh, but then, you know, I was a very junior faculty at the time in PIFR and uh, basically Professor Mukunda said I should give these lectures. And in those days, at least we didn't think of saying no to such requests. So I said, okay. So I studied hard and I gave the lectures. And uh, I should say it was quite an experience because Shantini Ketan had all kinds of fun, including power failures. And I was actually preparing lectures, holding a kerosene candle, a lantern in one hand and writing on a piece of paper in the other, with the other hand at night. So a lot of fun of a kind which uh, your generation mostly will not have. But anyway, uh, that's the course. And it was 14 lectures of probably 75 minutes each. Uh, now we have 10 lectures. I'm also going to take 75 minutes uh, for each lecture. So it has to be condensed a little. And uh, the only thing I can say is that, well, uh, missing things uh, will be found in the book. And uh, I'll be also following the book pretty closely, although not, you know, I won't be just reading it up. Uh, now, the disclaimer part is that, as I said, I'm not a mathematician and I don't uh, understand this subject at a mathematician's level of rigor. If I have to, I'll be able to pull out a proof from some book and study it and maybe even explain it to you. But usually as physicists, we don't have to. So we like to work with mathematical concepts uh, mixed with a bit of intuition. And I think that's how also most ordinary mortals work when they do theoretical physics. So my goal will be to help you build up the definitions, the concepts, the intuition, not necessarily the rigorous proofs. Uh, also, I won't be covering things which a mathematician might say, you know, that's the most important result in this area, you haven't even covered it. So, well, I won't be, that's, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not apologizing for that. So that's the disclaimer. Please make sure that you realize this is a course for physicists. All right, ticked off. Okay, now two warnings. Uh, this is a fun part and I, I've been looking forward to these two warnings. So let's get into it. The first is about motivation. So how does research in physics actually work? Uh, my perception how it works is that there's a motivation, which is basically some question about nature. This leads eventually to some postulate. This leads to consequences. And this then leads to uh, what you might call usefulness. So just to give you an example, the motivation is to understand Michelson-Morley experiment, which says speed of light is the same in all frames. The postulate uh, made by Einstein was the special theory of relativity. The consequences were lots of things like precession of perihelion or even just constancy of speed of light. And the usefulness has come about over the years. It has been checked with experiment. It also Theoretically, it's a very useful uh, formulation uh, because it applies to all branches essentially of physics where things can move at fast speed. Okay. Now, the important point in, the, in writing this is that this is a big puzzle, especially to students. Motivation does not lead to a postulate. If it did, then we would not have to wait for Einstein or wait for Planck or wait for somebody to come up with a great postulate. The motivation in this case was around for a long time. You cannot derive the postulate from the motivation. When I lecture, I often spend time on motivation, but I often get asked questions like, no, sir, but you are not able, you, your derivation is not satisfactory. And my point is, no, it's not a derivation. The postulate is the starting point for the researcher, but the researcher has studied the motivation. If you don't study motivation, you can still do relativity or quantum physics or even topology and differential geometry. But especially in the case of uh, physics, where I, I know it a little better, you won't be able to come up with really original ideas. You'll be a follower. The motivation is what makes the difference between a leader and a follower. The motivation is used by the leader to come up with an imaginative postulate. Now, this is how physics works. Uh, and here, I would say that if it was a physics lecture, you're not supposed to ask me the question, how did you get the postulate? Hmm. I hope this point is clear. You're not supposed to means is not a sensible question. I've been asked it 
a dozen times just in the very most recent course I taught, which was the first course on quantum physics. Okay, Schrodinger's equation, I can't derive it. Schrodinger didn't derive it. Nobody can derive it. It's a postulate. Okay, motivation, by the way, can also lead to multiple postulates. It can lead to the same motivation can lead to postulate one as well as two, which is better up to you. Heisenberg had a different postulate for quantum physics. It's also very good. Okay, so this is for physics. Let me show you the analogous thing as I understand it in mathematics. Motivation is still there, but now it doesn't lead to a postulate, which is a statement about nature. Rather, it leads to a definition. But then the definition will have consequences. Uh, and mathematicians use a nice snazzy word for it called theorems. And then we are back to the issue of usefulness. Usefulness in mathematics can be of many kinds, but it exists. It's a valid concept. It can be application type usefulness, or it could also be usefulness in proving interesting results. Just the fact that it's interesting in mathematics, that it's general, powerful, et cetera, et cetera. These are all uh, sort of payoffs for a mathematician, which tell us that the definition was a good one. But again, the same issue, don't try to go from motivation in a sort of rigorous way to definition. It's not that the motivation will always lead you to one definition. Definitions are made by human beings. And we don't know if, if history had been different, if X or Y had not been born at that time, the definitions would probably have been different. Again, there are multiple definitions. Okay, so this uh, point I want uh, to emphasize because uh, a lot of, you know, a typical lecture on topology and differential geometry um, for physicists would start with definitions. And I must say that even in uh, Shantini Ketan, probably in 87, I started with definitions uh, because that's what I knew. But uh, when writing up the notes and writing the book, it became clearer and clearer what's the motivation. So. Now I have to explain to you the motivation for studying this subject. Uh, but I'll again request you, don't ask me that how does the definition follow from the motivation? It doesn't follow. It's an attempt to address the motivation. I hope this point is clear and I'm ready to take a question or two on this if there is one now. You can type it in the chat box if you have any. Okay, and if there are no more questions, then I have achieved now I can put a tick mark against this as well as this. And now we'll get down to the actual lectures. Very good. Okay. Okay. And the first thing is going to be the study of topology and what is called a topological space. Now, uh, for this, a lot of people mailed me to ask about prerequisites. If you open the book, you will see a list of standard prerequisites in the theory of set, sets or set theory. So things like subset, uh, union, intersection. I really do hope you know these things. They are very standard and by themselves, they are very simple. This is the symbol for union, intersection, subset. Uh, and we'll be using these a lot, empty set, um, element, um, then of course the set of, then we have some special sets. Z is all integers, positive and negative, including zero. Q, I don't know how it's written, is rational numbers, which are the ratio of two integers. And R is real numbers. Now there's a very exciting history about how all these things were understood but that's a uh, too preliminary to this course. And uh, obviously I'm not going to go into it. And this is something you'll need to know. There are a couple more definitions, which I'll uh, give you. And then I'll uh, talk about the motivation. I had promised motivation. Now I'm writing just some, some things that you're supposed to know without motivation. And uh, I'll come back to motivation in a few seconds. Uh, what I'm doing here is basically following the book. So if, You'll have to get used to this kind of notation. If A is a subset of B, then the complement of A in B denoted 
a prime is the set a prime is equal to so curly bracket means set of all points x which are in b such that x is not in a all right yeah Abhinav has asked a nice question. If there are multiple definitions possible, how do we weigh one against another? That's a good and valid question. And the answer is usefulness. Each of the definitions has its consequences. And then we look at the usefulness of the consequences. Hmm? Okay, coming back to um, basically history does that weighing of different definitions. Hmm? You may know that quantum physics has two definitions, operator formalism and path integral formalism. What is the prevailing view? Both are great. Okay, I would say path integral formalism has been winning a bit in the last two or three decades for reasons I can explain uh, elsewhere. Sorry, that was a digression. Let's come back to this. Complement of A, uh, a in B is all points in B which are not in A. And this is how we write it. So these kind of notations will be useful. Uh, a few more I might um, need, but I'm not going to spend too much time writing uh, them down now because I really want to get on with the lecture, which uh, in a sense hasn't started yet. Okay, but one more definition we need and then we'll start. Of what is a function? A function uh, goes from a set A to a set B and it's a rule that assigns uh, which assigns uh, for each element A in A, a unique B in B uh, denoted F of A. So of course in pictures, it's always better. Here is the set A. Here is the set B, this has some elements, this has some elements. And if A happens to be this element, then the function F takes it to a particular element B. So that's how a function works. It's a map, okay? And you may notice already, I'm just using the very abstract picture of sets. My sets may not necessarily be real, numbers or integers or manifold or it's just any set. It can be a set of a table, lamp, chair, and computer. Okay, the beauty of sets is that it can be anything. It's very general. Yeah. Uh, Siddharth, this has a nice comment. Yes, all right. I think it, your comment might, your comment will come up in my lectures, but it's probably a bit, uh, already a bit detailed for people. All right, I'll get to it. Good, back to functions. So this is it. And there are certain classes of functions which are very useful or certain properties. So one is a surjective, also known as onto, is that every B in the range. So this is called the domain, this is called the range. Every B in the range uh, comes from at least one A in A. In other words, when we draw the arrows, you know, A goes to B, then some other element goes to some other element. Uh, every element of B is covered by arrows. That's why we mean, uh, that's why we call it on two. Okay, of course, two arrows can start from different A's and land on the same B. But the important thing is that no B should be left out. That's the significance of on two. Mm -hmm. That the image of all points together covers this. It may cover it in a sense multiply in the sense that some of the points in A may go to the same B. Many different points in A can go to B, but B is covered. Now that's surjective or on two. The other property is injective, uh, which is also known as one, two, one. And this is that every B, it's very simple to write, B and B comes from 
at most one in a. That means in if it's injective, you cannot have two different arrows from two different A's landing on the same B. Okay, but you can have some B's which don't come from any uh, A. So uh, injective is one to one, and uh, surjective is on to, and finally bijective is when both properties hold. Uh, surjective plus injective or uh, equivalently one to one and on to. And in this case, what happens is that there's it's a very satisfying picture. If this is A and B, then for a bijection, every, so this is A1, A2, A3, and here are B1, B2, B3. Then every, uh, let's say A1 goes to B1, A2 goes to B2, and A3 goes to B3. So there are no Bs left out. And also there are no uh, multiple arrows from the set A going to the same point in the set B. So that's one to one and on to. And uh, so this is a bijection. Now, when it's a finite set, that's all very nice. So if B has three elements uh, and there's a bijection from A, then A will also have three elements. Uh, but if the elements are infinite, then a lot of fun can happen. And it's all uh, again, part of interesting mathematics. It's uh, much less clear. Uh, how to count, well, you can't count the number of uh, elements of an infinite set, but there are ways of counting infinite sets, which goes into very interesting and somewhat exotic areas of mathematics. Good. So that's all the preliminary I wanted to give you. And now we're ready to start with the concept of a topological space. Now, the idea is to, so the motivation is to capture the concept of continuity without assuming, let's say, calculus. Okay, now of course calculus is, yeah, what's the subtle difference between isomorphism and endomorphism? Neither of those has uh, been defined here. So yeah, Anik, uh, this is an important point. You know, uh, don't ask me to uh, talk about things that I haven't yet defined. There will be isomorphisms, there will be endomorphisms, there'll be homeomorphisms and homomorphisms. All of them will be very different and they'll all apply to different things. At the moment, no morphisms are defined, okay? So uh, please be patient, uh, but also please keep in mind that all morphisms are equivalences of some sort, but we need to be very, very, very clear what they are equivalences between and what property they equate of two sets, okay? Isomorphism can come up in many different uh, contexts. And as I said, uh, if we need it, we'll come, we'll talk about it. Uh, but so far, none have been defined, hmm? okay? Good. So motivation of a topological space is to capture the concept of continuity without assuming calculus. Now I was saying, you know, historically think of it, calculus dates from Newton and Leibniz, okay? But topology and the concept of top topological space that we'll be discussing today uh, is a late 19th century kind of thing, development. Okay, so it took a couple of centuries, maybe three, maybe four, to go essentially backwards. We gave up, the idea was that whatever we know about continuity in calculus, in real analysis, let's try to abstract it and try not to use the language of, use the language of calculus, then we'll have a more general structure, which may apply to calculus, but it may also apply to other things. And it's that more general structure, which is called the topological space, okay? Now, if you remember uh, in calculus, uh, I use the word calculus interchangeably with real analysis, just studying functions on a real line, okay? Just the set of real numbers. 
Sometimes we'll use products of the real line like R2, which is a plane or R3, which is three dimensional space. So all of those involve calculus, okay? Now in calculus, we have this interesting thing that a function is continuous um, at A if f of x limit x tends to a from the left is equal to limit of f of x, x tends to a from the right, okay? Now, limit is essentially a calculus type of thing because limit uh, says, you know, that if, I'm, if, if x is in a tiny neighborhood of a, but that neighborhood is from the left and x is in a tiny neighborhood from the right, then as this neighborhood shrinks, then I get the limit. You know how to take a limit, right? There's an epsilon, then I take F at X and X plus epsilon, then I take epsilon going to zero in steps, that's the limit. But all of these things are not available to us in a set which contains a, a table lamp, a computer and a writing desk hmm? and a laptop. This is the set around me at the moment. So it just came to my mind. There's such an abstract, um, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Ajay. Yes. Shouldn't this be equal to uh, f of a? Of course it is. The point is, this is the condition for the function to be continuous. Once it's continuous, of course, we can also, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Maybe I should say that. You're right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think I went too fast. The limits should be equal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. That was a good point. The limits should be equal and they should be uh, equal to the value of the function. So, of course, yes. Um, yeah, I forgot that. It's a kind of trivial way of having a discontinuous function. If I had a function like this, and perversely I put this point here at A, then of course the limits are equal, but it's not equal to F. I apologize. Uh, indeed, that's correct. This is the definition of limit. So I was focusing on the fact that this limit concept requires something of involving distance and it involves some property of real numbers. And I'm going to ask the question, uh, yeah. Uh, Jayashri has asked, what's the difference between a topological space and a vector space? Uh, basically everything. Uh, let me just remind you that a vector space is a space where you can add things. Hmm? But there's no way in which I can add a table lamp to a computer, okay? Or a computer to a writing desk. So a to topological space is in general not a vector special cases be also a vector space. We'll have very little to say about vector spaces uh, in, in these lectures. We will have at some point when we talk of vector fields, but uh, please realize that topological space is going to be an abstract structure on a set of points. And what I don't want to assume is that those points in that set are either vectors or they are real numbers, or they are complex numbers, or they have any personality other than simply being elements of a set. We don't want to give them any other nature. And in spite of that, we want to be able to define continuity. Okay? Yeah. Yes. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Limit is defined only for continuous functions. No, uh, yeah, Abhishek, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that better. The function is continuous if these limits exist and are equal. These two limits that I've written should exist and are equal. If they are not, if they don't exist, of course, then it can't be continuous because then they can't be equal. Something which doesn't exist can't be satisfying equality. Now, Nekoma, and Dhruv, I'm actually not going to address your questions. And I thought I had made it clear, but uh, maybe you join later. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Hishikesh is right. Uh, they can have left and right hand limits. That's the example I've drawn over here. Okay. But Abhishek was saying that limit is only defined for continuous functions. And then he's saying, how can I say that a function is continuous if its limits from two sides agree? And what I'm trying to say here is that the limits from two sides should exist and agree, then it's continuous, otherwise it's not. If they only exist and don't agree, it's not continuous. Okay. Um, 
uh, yeah, I really need to go on. Uh, uh, so this is the discussion, sort of discussion, some of it that I didn't want to go into. Yeah. Uh, okay. So back to my question. This is a kind. Of, this is a kind of definition in calculus. How do I define such a thing uh, without using the concept of limit in the way it's understood in calculus? And it's going to take some time. And uh, to do that. We are going to introduce first some concepts in calculus, which are useful to generalize to more abstract spaces. So let me write that down. Introduce some familiar, so I introduce them, but you know them already. Some familiar concepts of calculus that can readily be made more abstract. And once we have the abstract version of these concepts, we'll use that abstract version to define a topological space. Okay, so that's the uh, process. Now, here you're going to be often confused because sometimes I'll be talking of concrete examples from calculus, and then sometimes I'll be talking of their abstract counterparts. So before you get confused or before you ask me, I'll request you to check from my notes or from the context, whether I'm talking about calculus or I'm talking about at the abstract concept. Hmm? These will both be spoken of together, but it's very important for them not to be uh, confused. Okay, so let's be in calculus for a while. So whatever I'm saying now is in calculus. And okay, it's not even calculus, maybe that's not the right word. Let's just look at the real line. So look at the real line. Okay, now there's a long history to the real line. It has numbers on it, um, all numbers uh, as we understand them. Uh, which can be integers, which can be rationals, and then which finally can be reals, including irrationals, transcendentals, and everything. Okay, and let's look at subsets. And for now, we are going to only marvel at the properties of these subsets, so special subsets. And I'll just remind you what type of subsets we sometimes talk about. One of them uh, is called the open interval. And on the real line, this is defined as A less than X less than B. Now here it's very important that I'm using less than, I'm not using less than or equal to. This curved line over A and over B indicates that the points A and B are not in the set. So the points in the set, I can sort of schematically mark by shading this region between, okay? This is called an open interval in Ah, I think we you probably encountered this. Uh, there's another kind uh, which is called a closed interval in R. And this is the set that does include its endpoints, A less than or equal to X less than or equal to B. There are also more general things. For example, I can have a semi open, I can have uh, a set such that A is less than X less than or equal to B. This is neither an open nor a closed interval. I can have another example uh, like this, okay? But I want to focus on these. These are the ones that will be interesting for our ensuing discussion, okay? Open intervals. Now, uh, the first thing I'll do is to generalize the concept of open interval so that it doesn't only apply to um, uh, a single interval, but to multiple intervals. Okay, so I'll define an open set in R uh, as um, uh, a set X satisfying 
that if a point x is in this x, that implies that x is inside an open interval, which is fully contained in x. Now, here's the first slightly non-trivial definition uh, in, this, in these lectures. Yeah, I'll come to zero and infinity, Shubham, just in a minute. Hmm? So, um, so this is the concept of an open set. It's a subset. So it's a sub set X subset of R satisfying that any point in it can be contained in an open interval, which is fully contained in the set. Okay. So let's give some examples and you'll get it. So for example, uh, open interval is itself an open set. Because uh, if X is in um, A, B, then X is also in, let's say, C, D, which is fully contained in A, B. It's easy to see from the picture if this is A and B, and these are distinct points, then I can always find another point C here and a point D here, such that this open interval is fully contained in the bigger one. So open interval is an open set. Now, another set of examples, which is very trivial to prove that they are an open set, is a set made up of multiple open intervals. Supposing I have A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, okay? So the set consists of all the elements interior to these regions together. It's a union of all of them, okay? This is an open set because if X is in any in this set, then it's in one of the intervals. And if it's in one of the intervals, then again, I can wrap it in a smaller open interval, which is fully contained in my set. So this is also an open set. So this is union of open sets. Okay. But now we get a third example where I consider the set from, let's say, zero all the way to infinity. Now, this is confusing. There's no real point called infinity. So this is just the set of x greater than zero. Okay. Is it an open set? And the answer, um, yeah, uh, Varun has asked A comma B is an interval. I didn't understand the question. What is the question? Yes, A comma B. Uh, I, I defined A comma B as an interval. Sorry. Varun, can you explain your question? Okay. Uh, okay. So our question was whether the set uh, zero uh, onwards hmm, is an uh, open set according to my definition. Answer yes, it is an open set for the very same reason. Because if you give me a point in it anywhere, and it doesn't matter where it is, but remember, infinity is not the name of any point, the point has to be a real number, it has to be a number that you can name or describe or define. And if you give it to me, then I can always find a C and D, which enclose it, and it lies fully in this set. So therefore, this is also an open set. Okay. Okay. So I've given you three examples of open sets. I've given you the example of an open interval, uh, of an open interval, of a union of uh, Sorry. Uh, ooh, yeah, this is where I did something I shouldn't have said. Union of open intervals. And the third example is a semi-infinite interval. Okay. In fact, let's give a fourth example. R itself, the whole real line, is an open set. For the same reason. Okay, if any point, if there's any real number which lies in R, obviously, then it can be uh, um, uh, enclosed in an open interval which lies fully in R. Okay. Now, here's a fun one. The empty set phi is an open set. Now, how do you argue this? Well, we have to go back. It's very pedantic, but we have to go back to the definition. And the definition says that for every X in capital X, X should be possible to enclose in an open interval. 
But when we say for every x in capital X, what if there isn't any small x in capital X? That is the case of an, uh, of an empty set. Now, if this side is never true, then the implication is actually true. Okay. It's like asking, do all green horses have five legs? The answer is yes, because there are no green horses. Therefore, all green horses do have five legs. Now, I'm sure that some of you are finding this uh, difficult to take, but I didn't invent logic, but I do think logic is a useful thing. Yes, X falls so quadly bet. Well, I had no idea that's what it was called, but it's a fact, good, okay. So now let's move on to the question, what is not an open set? Surely if we are defining this concept, then we should have counter examples. And the first example is a closed interval. The one which contains its endpoints. This is not an open set because if I take X to be the point A, that's in my set. This is the set X, but then no open interval inside X can enclose A. This whole set is X. Okay, and you see what the problem is. It's at the end of this set X, it's an endpoint. And if I try to put an open interval here, well, this end of this side, the right side of the open interval, uh, let's see, I can show it to you like this. This side will uh, be okay. I can, I can put something like that. But if I try to put something like this, it will always mix, miss some points, okay? Even if I put it exactly on this, well, the open interval doesn't contain the point X. If I put it here, now the open interval contains X, but that open interval is not in capital X, okay? So this is the kind of logic. Yeah, uh, Suraj, uh, uh, I think I, I, I gave a piece of advice and I'd like you to take it very seriously. Look at the real line. Right now, we haven't defined anything for table lamp uh, laptop. We are talking about the real line. Please be patient. Once we understand some properties of the real line, we'll apply them to abstract sets. That is the time when we can have a uh, topology on ab uh, abstract sets. Please understand that it took three centuries and I will do it in half an hour. I think that's an improvement in speed, but I can't do it faster than that, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pragadish, uh, it is not the boundless nature of the number line that helps us to define them. It is rather the, yeah, you might say that, it's rather the intuitive nature of real numbers, which by the way, was not obvious. I think people were not sure that there are irrational numbers or transcendental numbers. Each of these was a big moment in maths when people said, wow, these numbers do actually exist. Okay. Um, but yes, uh, yeah. No, phi, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Phi is a subset of R. It's the empty set. And the empty set is a subset of any set you like. Uh, same, uh, that same cute, uh, cute Latin term, which I've already forgotten. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, phi is very much a subset of anything. Hmm? The empty set. Okay. So we conclude that closed interval is not an, so this closed interval, sorry, closed interval this is not an open set. So this is one example. Okay. I can do something uh, similar, but with an infinite version of it. Let's say this is A and I consider A less than or equal to X, all X, which is greater than or equal to A, same problem. Again, not an open interval. Hmm? Uh, sorry, not an open set. Okay. So this is also not an open set. Very good. So we have a few uh, things that are not um, open sets. Now, what have I defined till now? Uh, open interval in R, closed interval in R, and open set in R. 
Uh, at this point, I hope it's very clear to you that these are three different things. Open interval and closed interval are single intervals and open set is the um, um, open set is the one that is generalizes open interval to multiple ones or also infinite ones. Somebody asked me to explain closed interval again. Uh, in, in the real line, a closed interval is just the same interval, but with less than or equal to signs. Hmm? You see this, uh, this uh, thing here, okay? So there are less than or equal to signs for the closed interval. It means that A and B themselves, those endpoints, are in the set X, while in the open interval, they're not in the set, okay? Okay, very good. So uh, if you've been attentive, you'll notice that I haven't yet defined a closed set. Now I could define a closed set by starting with a closed interval, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to define a closed set uh, as the complement in R of any open set. So if I take an open set, which satisfies the definition I've already given you over here, and I take its complement, that is all the points in R which are not in it, whatever that is, I'll call that a closed set. Okay, yeah. No, Vikash, a set which is not open is a closed set is not correct. In fact, there are sets which can be both open and closed. There are also sets which can be neither open nor closed. So again, I request you, don't rush, just just, uh, you know, rather than um, occupying your mind with rushing to the next step and predicting where it's going, well, the book has been around for 30 years, you can always read it, but uh, just try to appreciate the concepts as they come up and let's talk about the concepts which are coming. Hmm? Yeah, null set and empty set are the same. And I'll come, I'm giving you examples. I've just defined, <laughs> okay, it's nice. I suppose it's nice that you're all enthusiastic. But uh, just be patient also. Patience is not a bad thing. Okay. A closed set is the complement of in R of any open set. So let's try to list some closed sets. So let's try to list examples. So one, of course, you know, I defined the closed interval. So I called it closed. So it should be a closed set. Well, let's ask if it is a closed set by this definition. So for that, we need to know its complement. So its complement is, this you can easily guess, if I mark out the points A and B, then it's the thing from B up to plus infinity and from A up to minus infinity. So if this is A less than or equal to X less than or equal to B, this is X less than or equal to A union x greater than or equal to b. Sorry, uh, wrong number. Uh, this is exactly what I was afraid of. x less than a union x greater than b. Notice that because equality was allowed here in the complement, the equality is not there. Hmm? So the point a is in this, it can't also be in the complement. Good. Now, here's the complement. Is it an open set? Yes or no? I gave you the definition of open set. This is clearly an open set. Therefore, this is clearly a closed set. Therefore, the closed interval is a closed set. Interval in R is a closed set. Okay? Very good. Now, we could give more examples. Um, and one of the most interesting is that a single point A in R is a closed set. The easiest way to see that is to realize that it's the closed interval when A is equal to B. If A is less than or equal to X and less than or equal to A again, then X is equal to A, okay? If you try the same trick for the open interval, A less than X less than B, then of course there's no solution. That's the empty set. So the open interval with A equals B is the empty set. But the closed interval with A equals B is a single point. Therefore, a single point 
uh, any single point is a closed set. Okay, so I hope that one is clear. Uh, so these are two examples. Let's go on giving examples. Uh, three. Um, R itself, the whole of R is a closed set. Why? I think it's uh, now clear. I'll, you can put your answers in the chat if you like. Uh, if you don't understand the proof, uh, put that in the chat. But yeah, it's complement of null set. Thank you, Shubham. Exactly right. Similarly, phi is a closed set by a similar reasoning. So in fact, phi and the whole real line are both open and closed. So we see an example, two examples of sets which are both open and closed. Okay. Now, what about sets which are neither open nor closed? Yes. Uh, Anirban, yes, there is a definition of closed sets using closed intervals. Uh, and in fact, as we'll see, the whole concept of topology can be defined through closed sets rather than open sets. But, uh, you know, one is good enough and the other I'll leave as an exercise. So, yes, there is a certain symmetry between them because you see complement is a very symmetric relation. The complement of this is that, then the complement of that is this. So, I can really transport any definition involving a set to definitions involving its complement. Good. Now, let's look at some more examples. Let's look at this weird thing called semi-open interval, which is A less than X, less than or equal to B. This is not, uh, not open that we saw some time back. What about it being closed? Could it be closed? Well, if I take the complement of this, I'll get this down to, to the left and this to the right. So this point B is not included in the complement while A is not included in the original set. So it's also not closed. It's neither open nor closed. There's no law that every set has to be both open, uh, has to be either open or closed. There are sets which could be neither. Yes, open interval and open set. Thank you, Dipendra. Yes, I will explain that. Um, the open interval is just the single, is this set. Precisely this. Oops. Yeah. Okay. So it's one range of numbers with two endpoints and not including the two endpoints. Open set is more general. Open set includes things like union of open intervals, and it also includes uh, an interval which is semi infinite. And it may include other things. We haven't necessarily. Um, we haven't necessarily listed all possible open sets, but the definition is that if X is in a capital X is called open if every point in it can be enclosed by an open interval which is fully empty. Okay, good. So that's the, the key difference is open uh, set is more general. Open interval is a very specific kind of subset open uh, set is a more general kind of set, but it has the same topological properties as we'll see. Okay, good. Now, again, I remind you, we are still talking only about real numbers and uh, we haven't yet gone to uh, the concept of a topological space in the abstract with involving the table lamps and laptops. I promise you it will happen. Yeah, uh, can I explain the last example? Uh, Sachin, you should try to understand it looking at what I've written here. See, the notation is clear. Uh, this one is clearly not open because it has one of its endpoints. And because of that endpoint, I can't enclose this point in an open interval, which is fully contained in this. If I look in the complement, then because of this point, this can't be enclosed in an open interval, which is fully in the complement. Okay, that means it's neither open nor closed. More details are in the book. Okay. Now, we need a few more observations before we can actually get to our uh, goal. And we are going predictably much slower than planned. So let me list for you some properties of open sets in R. 
and uh, one of them will turn out to be a little bit fun and non-trivial. Okay. So property A is that the union of any number of open sets is open. In fact, uh, if you want to make the open set I described, uh, which goes, let's say, from A to all the way to infinity, I can make it a union of, let's say, this and this and this. Let's say that A is equal to zero. Then the open interval zero to one, zero to two, zero to three. And let me take the union of all such open intervals, zero to n over all n. Hmm. So that gives me what is sometimes called zero to infinity. Here it's not clear how to put the bracket, whether it is, you can put it this way. Sometimes people put it this way. Uh, the important thing is that uh, um, this, by taking an infinite union of larger and larger open intervals, or open, which are open sets, I can get this infinite open set. Hmm? No contradiction here. In fact, you can see why this union property is not problematic because you see, if X is contained in any of these intervals, then I can always enclose it in a smaller interval, which is in the bigger interval, okay? So in the union, that property will still hold. Now, because union is an inclusive thing, we just add points. Now, the next question is, what about the intersection of open sets? And now is where there's a fun result. The intersection of a finite number of open sets is open, but this is not true if I try to take an infinite number. So let's look at examples of this to show you why this is so. First, let's take two open sets which are disjoint, A, B, and C, D. So of course, A, B intersection C, D has no points in common. So this is equal to five, that the null set or empty set, that's very good, that's open. So intersection of these non-overlapping guys is open. What if they are overlapping? Well, then here is A and B, and here is C and D. Hmm? Now the intersection is this place in here. Okay, so in this case, AB intersection CD is equal to CB in this example, right? Because this is one and this is the other. So the intersection is the common region. And of course, as you see, it has the proper inclusion or non-inclusion. It doesn't include C and B. So it's perfectly open. So intersection of two overlapping open sets is open, at least for intervals. Yeah. Uh, no, accountable and finite is not the same exact thing. And let me let me not uh, you know I, when I, by finite I think we we, we know what we mean, uh, Monica, very clearly by the word finite finite number. Mm -hmm. So I would rather not use the word countable. Okay. Okay. Uh, somewhere in the chat, the discussion has gone to power set, which I haven't even defined. But okay, uh, whatever you like. Good. Now let me show you why I'm insisting that only for finite number, this is not C, sorry. Uh, why only for finite number? Can something go wrong if I take an infinite intersection? So here's the example. Supposing I take uh, the intersection over all N of the open intervals minus one by N to one by N with N going from one to infinity. What is this intersection? It's a collection of, I start with minus one to plus one. Now I intersect it with minus half to plus half. Of course, minus half to plus half is fully contained in minus one to one. So the intersection is minus half to plus half. Now I intersect it with minus one, one third to plus one third. And you see that the intersection is getting smaller and smaller. Okay, but I'm taking the infinite intersection. 
Now I'm taking the infinite intersection and you see that in this collection, the overlapping region is getting smaller and smaller. So it was this much, now it's this much, later it will be this much, and it will be a shrinking set of open intervals until in, when I take the intersection over all of them, the only point that's contained in that intersection is the origin. It's a single point O, but a single point is not an open set. A single point cannot be contained in an open interval, which is contained in a single point. Hmm? Follow the definition, single point is not an open set. So we learn the valuable lesson that a any union but only finite intersection is again open. Okay. Now, this is the set of properties we need, uh, which are all two on R in order to abstract them. Okay. So now we are going to jump to so far we were studying R. Interestingly, not only we were studying R, but we were studying R with a particular topological structure on it, which we didn't even realize. We didn't realize because we didn't know what is a topological structure. It's just the natural one that comes naturally for free with R. And we'll see why in the next uh, lecture. And in fact, what we have been studying is called R with the usual topology. This usual topology is a very natural uh, thing. And that's why everything I've said is comes very naturally to us. Now we move away from R. Now, from this moment, move away from R and define a uh, <clears throat> topological space in the most abstract way possible in abstract so abstract hmm? now uh, usual topology is same as standard topology probably yeah there are a lot of questions okay i don't mind pausing a few seconds for questions let's see uh, Yeah, okay, uh, all good questions, but I think I've answered them and they're all answered in the book. Um, usual is same as standard, I believe so. Why a set of real numbers are both open and closed set? Yeah, um, Jayashree, uh, please uh, follow the definition rigorously. Hmm? Um, Certain sets are open if they satisfy a property which I wrote down. Certain sets are closed if they satisfy a property that I wrote down. And what I showed is that the set of all real numbers is both open and closed. Is that your question? The set of all real numbers is open because from the definition, any point in it can be enclosed in an open interval, which is fully in the set of real numbers. So it's open. That we said long ago. Why is it closed? A closed set is the complement of an open set. Okay. Now it so happens that the empty set is open. Its complement is the whole set of real numbers. Therefore, the set of real numbers is closed. Hmm? So the proof is literally by applying, please don't try to bring in too much intuition here, literally apply the definition. These are very, very precise definitions. And if probably most of you are physicists, though I suspect some mathematicians are lurking, uh, but most of you probably rely on your intuition to do physics. And here also intuition is important, but you must not lose sight of the definition. Hmm? If you are not sure of a definition, I really advocate the old fashioned way, take a blank piece of paper and write it out and look at every word in it. Hmm? That's how we understand the definition. Yeah, no concept of order or ascendance has been introduced yet. We can always find a set near no, uh, no. Uh, usual means metric topology, yes. Real numbers minus rational numbers, I'm not even going to go into that. Uh, is real numbers minus rational numbers open? No, I believe it. it's not. I'm pretty sure it's not. 
because you should be able to fit an open interval into that and obviously you can't. Uh, is the definition of open set using open interval general? Can we use it for integers also? No, absolutely we cannot. Hmm? This is, these are concepts which belong to the real numbers. Hmm? And I want to emphasize that they will generalize to direct products of real numbers. Like the, on the plane, we will have some similar concept like open disk and closed disk. In three space, we'll have open ball and closed ball. Don't try to apply these to integers, okay? We can define a topology on integers, but not in this way, and I haven't done it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Recommended text, please go to the web page, which I told you about. Let me put the web page here again. Uh, tdg-is.blogspot.com has all uh, the references for the course and everything else that you'll need. Okay, good. Now on the way, we've slightly lost track of motivation. I had promised you a motivation. The motivation was to understand continuity and continuous functions, okay? But we instead went into a long digression about open and closed sets. We are now going to use those to define the concept of a topological space. And then we are going to show that in a topological space, there can be a concept of continuous function, which is the usual one in the real life. Okay. And again, I hope you appreciate that we are abstracting something which was more or less concrete before. It was concrete on the real line. Now we are abstracting it to abstract sets. So that's what we are going to do now. So now we are going to define the concept of topological space. And it is two things, a set S together with a collection of subsets Uh, small u of s. The collection, by the way, will be called capital U. A collection capital U of subsets uh, u of s satisfying the following conditions. I will, uh, the following conditions. I'll go into this in with examples soon. Okay, one. So it's a set capital S, that set could have, as I promised, a table lamp, a computer, and a, a desk, okay? So it can have three elements or five elements, but I'm not only going to give you the set, I'm also going to give you a preferred collection of subsets, those subsets which I like, okay? And not to keep the secret too long, those subsets will be called open sets. They'll just be called open sets. Mm. They have nothing immediately to do with open sets in R. These are abstract open sets. So it's something that I give you, but it will have to have a few properties which I'm going to write down. So one is that this collection should include the empty set and it should also include the full set. By analogy, because with the real numbers, the collection of open sets included the empty set and the full set. So here also we are going to say that this collection of open sets, capital U, uh, includes the empty or null set and the full set. That's one requirement. Two, the union of, uh, oh, sorry, I wrote something. There should be subset symbol. These are not elements, these are uh, subsets. Hmm? The union of any number of subset small ui in the collection u is again in u. Three, the intersection of finitely many ui in u is again in u. And with these definitions, the set uh, S comma U, remember 
S is a set of elements and U is a set of subsets of S. Okay, is called a topological space. And uh, U, the set of subsets, is called a topology on S. And well, it will take a while for this to sink in and it will only sink in when we do a few exercises of which we'll do a few right now. But the key point is that the set can be anything. The set S will start with the set, okay? But the collection of subsets will define the topology. And what we see is that on the real line, we took a natural collection of subsets, uh, which were called open sets. Hmm. The set of all open sets is capital U in that example, in the usual topology. But we could have taken a different collection of open sets by defining them differently. And we would have got a different topology on the same set of numbers, in that case, R. Okay. Likewise, if I, if I have a set of three or 10 or 100 or million elements, okay, I can define many different topologies on the same set. But I can also define collections, capital U, which are not topologies. They won't be topologies if they fail to meet all these three conditions. Okay, so if somebody says, well, on your set of five elements, I'm giving you a topology, then you should first check whether it is a topology by verifying one by one is empty set in that collection, is full set in that collection, is union of any number of sets in the collection, again in the collection, is intersection again in the collection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's some discussion going on here and that's perfectly okay with me, but it is a little bit disturbing other people. I'll leave you to sort that out. Yeah, uh, Arpana, it is necessary that the intersection has to be finite. And the reason is that by the example I gave, which was part of the motivation, which was for the real line, uh, the intersection of infinitely many uh, open intervals could lead to a non-open set in that case. So what we are doing now is abstracting the properties, which we like, to give a definition of topology and topological space. And here comes uh, back something I said at the very beginning of the course. You can't ask me to prove that these are the correct properties to abstract because these lead to a definition, okay? And I could have started this lecture with this slide. This is a topological space. It doesn't use anything I've said before, okay? Just a definition of topological space. All I've tried to reason is that these properties I've shown you are satisfied by something which in our mind is a natural structure on the real line. And they allow a more general, more general solutions than the example of the real line with the usual topology. That's why it's interesting. Hmm? S is not a set of sets. Okay, these are good questions. S is not a set of sets. S is just a set of elements. U is a set of sets. Okay, the topological space has both things in it. Uh, S comma U. S is a set of points and U is a collection of subsets of the set S, okay? Now, the first thing to realize, and I can't make you realize it directly, you'll have to sort of think it over, is that this, uh, these properties are all true of the open sets in R, which we defined earlier. And therefore, by this definition, uh, the structure of open sets in R does define a topo topological space. Yeah. Shouldn't U be just a subset of S instead of proper subset? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by proper subset? There's really, uh, uh, I don't know what you mean by proper subset. I Subset is any subset. I, I never said anything about being proper. No, I didn't understand the question. Please, uh, can you explain what you mean by proper? Anshul, finitely many means finitely many. Finitely many means the following. You first give me an integer, um, uh, any positive integer, any one that you like, okay? 
then finitely many means I can take the intersection of that number, whatever integer you gave me of uh, open sets and I'll again get an open set. Finitely many has a very, very precise meaning. It means finitely many. There's really no better way to say it. But I think the best way to get some discipline on that question is to say that first you give me the number, any number. I'll allow you to choose any number. You can even choose a number which will take you one month to write down and come back to me with that number. Intersection of that number of open sets will still be an open set. If there is, if there are so many open sets. In this case, it depends on the original set S. We've said nothing about whether the original set, set itself is finite or infinite. But if it's infinite, doesn't matter. You can give me any number of open sets to intersect. What you can't do is give me some kind of rule to intersect open sets with a label over all values of the label uh, from one uh, indefinitely or to infinity, as we said. Hmm? So there's a clear distinction. Yeah. Let's see what are the other questions. Yeah, Telegram group, fine. Union of open sets is itself open. Yes, exactly right. Thank you. Third point, finitely many is finitely many. Just explain. Proper subset, I did not understand. U being defined as a power set. No, no, no. U is not the set of all subsets. It is a set of subsets. Power set, okay, I haven't defined it, but power set is a set of all subsets of S. U is not that. I never said it was that. Huh. It is a collection of subsets of capital S. Which collection I can choose. Each one gives a topology if these conditions are satisfied. Okay, it is definitely, it is not in general the power set. That is, it is not all S, null, and U. I didn't understand that question of Vikram. No. Topological space, a generalization of Euclidean space. No, it only generalizes one property of Euclidean space, which is the topological property. Is U a super set of S? S is a set of points and U is a set of sets. So you cannot compare them. Hmm? Proper subset means that it's not the whole set. So no, it could be any, it could be, yeah, I didn't say, where, did, where in my notation did I say it's proper? Uh, are you taking this symbol to be, to mean proper subset? No, for me, the symbol subset is any subset. S is also a subset of S. Hmm? Word collection here referred to a set of sets. Yes, Chakradhar, yes, that's the correct statement. Is U a power set of S? Look, I'm getting rusty. I don't know the definition of power set, but I thought power set means the set of all subsets. Hmm? And I'm emphasizing that U is not the set of all subsets. Yes, are the subsets U made up of elements which are present in S? Yes, obviously. I, I've written that here, I think. Old notation system in which usual subset sign is for proper subsets. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dhruv. That uh, solves my confusion. So, uh, yeah. For me, subset is any subset. Hmm? A is a proper subset of B. If A is a subset of B and A is not equal to B. Yes, I understand that. All I'm saying is I never said it has to be a proper subset. So, for me, subset has nothing to do with being proper. And S is a subset of itself in my terminology. Hmm? Okay. How I, do I differentiate if phi and S belong to U or phi and S are subsets of U? No, phi and S cannot be subsets of U. Doesn't make any sense. Phi and S are sets, okay? The elements of U are sets. So phi and S being sets could be elements of U. One option, instead of asking all these questions, is to wait the next five minutes till I give you some examples. How about that? Hmm? I don't want to stop your questions, but I do think that uh, what are those subsets? Yeah, um, does the union of open sets in the above have to be countably finite? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, the statement in the mathematics literature is arbitrary union. Okay, so yeah. Um, I, I, I'll think about whether it has to be countably, countably finite. No, it could be infinite, right? So what do you mean countably finite? Does each different collection, yes, yes. Ashwat, very good question. Does each different collection of you give us a different topological space? Yes, if that collection satisfies one, two, and three. And if it doesn't, it gives us no topological space at all. Hmm? 
Very good. This is the key point. You asked the key question. Small U's need not be open sets. Well, they are called open sets. Remember, I've never defined open sets in the abstract setting. You're supposed to forget what we did before. Uh, no longer assume anything above because it was for R. Hmm. This was a point of transition where I stopped talking about R. R is now a special case of the general thing. Hmm? Can I review the conditions of topological space? Sure. U is a subset of power set of S. Yes, that is correct. If that helps you, that's absolutely correct. This cannot be restricted. Yes, proper subsets were never in my mind. A given set gives rise to many topologies because U is not unique. Yes, yes, yes. Vikash, thank you. Very good. A given set S can give rise to many topologies because U is not unique. This is even true for the real line. And I'll show you many topologies on the real line. It turns out, now you may be disappointed, most of them are not that interesting, but they're certainly there. Yeah. So yes, uh, what specific subsets are those, the collection? That's up to us. The specific subsets which are in the collection, the collection of which is the set capital U, is my choice of a topological space. Okay. So I can have three different topological spaces based on the same. Again, you know, you'll get it if you just wait a bit when I give examples. Yeah. Notation confused you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Maybe that was about the proper subset business. R is a universal set. Is it R is not being discussed here? Uh, uh, See, don't bring in R until I do examples, please. S is my universal set here. Hmm? S is an abstract set. And since S is in U by the first axiom, so S is an open set always by definition. Let me just, I will continue. Yeah, let's please be patient. Yes, U contains all possible subsets. No, yeah. Can be infinite union. Yes, countably infinite. Yes. Arbitrarily un arbitrary union, countable or uncountable. I'm happy to go with that. Uh, collection of subsets U and U finite or need not be, need not be. Euclidean and topological space, because to uh, the, how do we differentiate? Because here we have not said what is the set S. As I repeat, it can be the set of uh, table lamp, <laughs> uh, laptop, and a writing desk. So, you know, before, I, I feel if many of you had held the questions, we would be 15 minutes ahead of time. Maybe next time I'll have to choose not to answer some of your questions. I encourage you to ask, but I really wish you would be a little more patient. Uh, I'm giving you the example now. Example. S equals the set A. Now, this will cause confusion because you'll ask me whether A is less than B and all that. So let me... Uh, call it the set of uh, uh, lamp, uh, desk, and laptop. Okay, so this is my set. It has three elements. Now, you can be many possible things, okay? Each one defining a topology. So my example, U is a set which contains sets. So the first set in U is five, five, the empty set. The second one is the full set. S. I won't write it out. It's written up for you before, uh, above. Now, I'll also add lamp as an open set. And I'll stop there. U is a collection of three open sets. Is this a topology? Is, does it define a topology? So what were the three things to check? Is phi in the collection? Yes, it is. Is it? S, the full set in the collection. Yes, it is right here. Phi is right here. Okay. Now, the union of any number of these is again in U. Okay. If I take the union of lamp with itself, I keep getting lamp. So it's there. If I take the union of lamp with S, I get S, which is there. If I take the union of lamp with phi, I get lamp, which is there. So union of any number of open sets is in my collection. Right? Okay. Now, intersection. If I take the intersection of phi, well, phi and S, I never have to test. If I take the intersection of phi and lamp, I get phi, which is there. If I take the intersection of S and lamp, I get, I get somebody, lamp, very good. So if I take the intersection of S and lamp, I get lamp, it's there. 
And if I take the intersection of lamp with lamp, it's also there. So this is a topology. And these three are the open sets. Now, they don't look anything like open intervals, still less like infinite intervals, but they are the open sets of this topology. Now, let me give you a different topology with the same set. Pi, S, lamp, and desk. Uh, and another set, which is lamp, as well as desk. Okay, topology, yes or no? Okay, phi is there, s is there. Now, if I take the union, well, you can again check. It's pretty easy to check. Um, lamp and with lamp and desk, gives me lamp and desk. So union is there. Intersection of these two is lamp, the so lamp is there. Generally, you have to only check the sets which are not uh, phi and s. Hmm? So this was a good topology. This is also a good topology. Okay. Now let's try another one. U equals phi s lamp um, desk. And uh, desk, what was my third element? Laptop. Okay, is this a topology, yes or no? And now it take, should take you only a second to see that union of lamp and desk is the set lamp comma desk. That's not there. So not a topology. Okay. Intersections are all good, actually. Desk with desk laptop is desk. Lamp with desk laptop is five. You just have to keep checking things. Okay. But this is not a topology because union of lamp and desk is not in it. Okay. And this is basically how we go. Uh, I should have stopped long ago. That was my plan. Uh, now, up to this point, I've given you a very abstract definition and I cannot uh, in the next uh, few seconds tell you why it's useful. That will be next time. But I have a few suggested uh, you know, changes in procedure for next time. One, yes, please do have, oh, can I please explain second example again? Uh, this one, uh, I guess he means this, let me do that. Okay, so to check whether this is a topology, I need to check whether the intersection and union of these sets are in the same list. Hmm. This set of axioms says union of any number of elements of the list of open sets is again an open set, so again in the list. Also intersection of finitely many should be again in the list. Okay, so when I checked second example, which is this one, I hope that's the one you wanted. The union of this and this is lamp and desk. Okay, if you're not sure about my unions and intersections, you need to read about it. Wikipedia will tell you everything you need to know about union and intersection. So union of lamp and lamp desk is lamp desk. Intersection of lamp and lamp desk is only lamp, the ones which are common to both. Okay, and both of them are in the collection. So this is a topology. In this case, what happened is that the union of lamp and desk is not in the list. There's no entry in this collection called bracket lamp comma desk. I didn't put it. Now I could add it. Once I add it, it will be a topology. Hmm? Okay. So uh, I think I'll stop here. I'm, uh, it's time and I really don't like going over time, but I'll be happy to answer questions for a few minutes. But first, let me finish saying what are the changes for next time. One. Uh, people who want to have internal discussions, yes, they should. And I think they should take the suggestion to start a Telegram group or some other group. Um, what you could do if you want, if you want it to be open group, then send me the link and I'll put it on the blog page and other people can look it up and join the group. If you want a closed group between friends, that's your problem and that's up to you. I don't dictate what you can do. Okay. Why, yeah, why do we, a basic question from Shishira, why do we need to define a topology? So I'll request you to stay on for at least three more lectures and I promise the question will be answered. Hmm. Uh, but I've already given you one hint at the beginning of this lecture, namely that it is to enable us to define continuity and understand the concept of continuity in an abstract setting. Abstract is always more general. 
once we have a general setting, we can ask very interesting collections, not only about R, but about all kinds of topological spaces, which may not just be Euclidean. Okay. So it's to enable us to ask questions about continuity. Now, I haven't shown you that, and I will show it to you next time. It's not useful to classify sets. It doesn't give us any way of classifying sets. Hmm? And well, somebody may classify it. It is obviously possible to write all possible topological spaces having three elements. Okay. I can just continue trying all possibilities and whichever ones are okay are okay. But that's not very much uh, the point. The purpose of these examples is to show you that we do not need to assume the properties of the real line and we still can define a structure, that of topological space, which is satisfied by the real line uh, under our definition of open sets on R. So it's more general. Uh, if you missed the beginning of the lecture, I would like to again uh, repeat for you this first thing which I said, and I said it very well advisedly. Motivation to definition. So my motivation today was the real line and my definition was topology. The, the properties of real line were things that are well known. I didn't show you anything that you didn't already basically know about the real line, but we came up with a definition. The definition is not derived from the motivation. Huh? So this is the reason I said that, yeah. Since we have, yeah, why are we using the term open sets for you? Just because it's a nice term. Mm, we need some term for it. And what we did was to use open sets because in the case of R with the usual topology, these will be open sets on R. So in general, they're called open sets. Hmm? I wonder how many of you sit and wonder about why things have the names they have. Why is topology called topology? Why is geometry called geometry? Okay, why is a manifold called a manifold? All have their reasons. By the way, manifold, I don't know how many of you know, that uh, manifold is a concept in plumbing, in joining pipes. The so plumbers have a different meaning for manifold. So, you know, words are used just so that they become a convention and we keep using the same words to mean the same thing. So instead of saying the collection U of special sets, uh, subsets of S, we just call it the collection of open sets. So U is the collection of open sets. Yeah. What is U and S in usual topology? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Usual topology on R. Please be very specific. Huh? You have to first tell me. Ah, so S, S is R. Otherwise, there's no usual topology. I have not defined anything called usual topology for lamp and disk. There's no usual topology. Hmm? On R, there is a usual topology. In that topology, S is the full real line. And U is the collection of all open sets on R, which I defined earlier in this lecture as those sets where if a point is in the set, it can be enclosed by an open interval, which is also in the set. Okay. So that's the collection U when S is R and that defines one topology. And we don't have to prove it because we already saw that that definition satisfies these three axioms, which you can see. So it's a topology for sure. Yes, the idea is to find, uh, no, the, I, no the, Rohan, the idea is not to find subsets that satisfy the property, but to define a collection of subsets that satisfy the property. Hmm. One subset cannot satisfy or not satisfy. For example, you can't ask a question from this set as lamp desk laptop, whether lamp desk is a good open set or not. It is not an open set in this topology. In this topology, lamp desk is not an open set. In this one, it is an open set. In this one, this is not even a topology, so I can't even ask the question. Okay, the question, the point is that U is the defined set of open sets on that set. This is the definition of the set of open sets and it defines a topology. And as I said, you can define any topology you like. The interesting question is not defining it, but showing that it's useful. And for useful, you'll have to wait through all the 10 lectures. So that is a matter which will take you a lot of time. Uh, yes. 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 I think, yeah, actually Shivam has a good suggestion. You know, I have a bad habit and today I felt that bad habit was really annoying me, probably annoying you also. 
is that if I see a question, I rush to answer it. So next time, uh, I'll ask for questions. That time, till that time, save your questions. When I ask for questions, paste them. I'll answer a few and I'll move on. I think much better with a large audience. Okay. Only open sets lead to topology is not a meaningful question. Uh, it's a definition and it's a definition of open sets. So they, they, that's not a meaningful question. No. Motivation. Huh? Historically, was it developed to try to define continuity without analysis? Why were mathematicians looking for something else and not just satisfied with the analysis approach? Well, math. Okay, I have no deep answer, but mathematicians are always looking for something else. That's the first rule. The second rule is we need to know, we, first of all, let me tell you one thing before, Sh Sh Shudipta, am I making you crazy? I'm now seven minutes over time. Just shout at me if I'm going really. No, no it's fine. It's absolutely okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Let me say one thing here. You see, um, finally, we are going to use this definition only in the context of differentiable manifold. So why are we even doing this? It's useful to know which properties of the object we are studying depend on what underlying feature or which features depend on the underlying property. For example, a manifold in physics is a, is a, is a, is a, it's a differentiable space, it is a topological space, it's a differentiable space, it's a metric space. Now, when we, all these things will come now, when we refer to a given property of that space, are we referring to the property which follows from differentiation, from continuity, which is topology, or from the metric? And we need to know that. So topology helps us to clarify which part of the properties of R. You see, R has lots of properties. Euclidean space is full of properties. Okay, which of those are topological? That is what we have considered the abstract definition of topology for to help us understand what it even means to say topological. Probably you have seen on Wikipedia or in some popular science talk that a donut is the same as a coffee cup because one can be deformed into the other. Okay, now, right, there's a continuity implied in that, but continuity defined how? Do I need to put a metric on this donut, then if I put a metric, then the coffee cup has a different metric. So it's not the metric. Hmm. So topology is the most underlying property of the Euclidean space that we need to understand. That's why we are trying to understand it in the abstract concept. It's because it's a particular prop. It captures certain aspects, not all aspects of the real line. So, you know, it's like asking, you know, why am I a heart surgeon and not a brain surgeon. I can't be a surgeon of everything, okay? But as a medical person, I can focus my attention on the heart aspect of the human body and possibly know less about the other aspects. But the human body doesn't make sense without all the different parts. Do you understand that? So topology is one part of the study and we are trying to make it abstract so that we can focus on its essential properties. I think I should stop now. Isn't LAMP desk contained in S? No, 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 no. Where LAMP desk has to be contained in U, not in S. It is U which is a collection of offsets. And please read this carefully. The union of any number of sets in U is again in U, not in S. I never said it has to be in S. Every subset is in S. Hmm? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Akash, questions after the lecture is done. So look, I promise, I, I think I did a horrible job this time with questions because I have never dealt with a 300 audience Zoom call before. What we'll do is we won't, we'll take questions two or three times during the lecture, every about 20 to 25 minutes at a logical break point. Even if I see a question in between, I won't answer it till my logical break point. Yes. Sunil, if I have a yes. suggestion, maybe we can keep the chat box off because many of the questions will be answered when you are yeah, starting. That's all, yeah, but you know, I, the problem is this, you know, I hate keeping, I hate saying <laughs> chat box off and I hate telling students not to ask questions because that is what makes uh, our school training so bad. You know, <laughs> just shut up and follow my definition, repeat it by heart, you know, you know what I mean, right? I hate doing, it just goes against my grain. So please, please, 300 people or 400 people, whoever you are, exercise a little discipline. Don't just ask the first thing that pops into your mind. Do ask if you need a clarification. 
Okay, if you have a Slack channel, ask somebody else. And uh, yeah, Abhijit wants to know why the second property in the definition of topological space is not trivially true. Abhijit, I just gave you an example where it's not true. In this, it's, in this example, it's not true. So how can it be trivial? Yeah, Aryadeep has answered it. Good. Open sets are and topological space are defined together. Neither of them comes first. The topological space is a set and a named collection of its open sets, a preferred collection of its subsets, which I call open sets. I define it. Hmm? Which is the book that Sir was talking about? Well, let me again mention the web page. Everything that you need is at tdg dot phase uh, dash phase not underscore dot blog. This I'm doing because people joined late and missed it. This is the web page. All such things answered. Yes, Shishra. Yes, choice of UIs depend on us. Why? So that we can define more than one topological space. Chat box not off, but mute would help me. Oh, well, it was okay. Yeah, number of people will decrease. What does open set mean in the definition of topology? It's part of the definition. Uh, topology of setters follow some rules. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, good, good, good. I think, uh, and some Slack thing has been posted here by Sahil. And so please everyone take note of it. What is the difference between geometry and topology? Uh, I don't know. What is the difference between uh, cars and planets? Uh, okay, maybe that's not a very good example. Um, you know, they're just different concepts. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, U equals phi comma S seems like the simplest topology. Uh, Shanak, uh, I think you missed the beginning of the lecture. Please again, take note of this. 